We've just had the 2024 Spanish Grand Prix at everyone's favourite Formula One track, the Circuit de Barcelona Catalunya. It has exciting features such as corner. Whenever we have a race here, we hear from the commentators how this is the Formula One track, the most standard of all the tracks, the true representation of whether your car is quick or not. For a long time, Catalonia was the standard winter testing track in Formula One for a few key reasons. It's cheap, it's warm in February, and it's easy to get to. But it was also used as it has a wide variety of sections and corners that represent the entire calendar and therefore are a good test of all the things a Formula 1 car needs to do for the year ahead. It has low speed corners, high speed corners, medium speed corners, medium speed corners, medium speed, medium speed, medium speed, medium speed, medium speed corners. Perfect for getting your car ready for the season to come. Obviously, Catalonia is not the winter testing track anymore. Bahrain took that honour when it started hosting the season opener. And even though for the first time in six years, Australia will host the first race next year, <laughs> testing will remain in Bahrain for the foreseeable future. And so F1's perfect, most average track might fall into obscurity, particularly when the Spanish Grand Prix moves to Madrid in 2026. But this got me thinking. Is Catalonia actually the most average track? I know people say it a lot, but is it actually true? Now, you may be asking yourself, why should I care? But knowing the most mid of all the tracks is useful as it helps us to understand car performance. If your car is good on the track that's most similar to every other track, well then, it's going to be good on every other track too. So how do we find the most average track? There's so many different ways we could rank them. Length, speed, number of corners, elevation, attendance, pit lane lost time, number of house pole positions, average ticket cost, bendiness, full throttle percentage, number of garage or motorhome fires in the last 12 years. There's so many different ways we could rank them and every single one is going to give a different answer. How do we choose? Well, in case you haven't noticed, this is a Mr. V's Garage video, which means we don't have to choose. We're gonna do all of them, baby. But first, as this is a Mr. V's Garage video, I need to tell you about today's sponsor, Mr. V's Garage. Com. That's right! In case you haven't heard, the Mr. V's Garage shop is now open. We've got shirts, we've got hat, just one, I don't want to go crazy. And we even have the very first Mr. V's Garage sticker pack featuring multiple stickers of my stupid face. These are guaranteed to have people asking you some very weird questions if you stick them to your laptop or whatever. I only made a hundred of these, so get them while you can. With this shop, I wanted to make some clothing that's good quality, but also looks good, so people would be happy wearing them even if they've never even heard of the channel. Trust me, if you get a cargo vroom vroom cap, everyone loves the cargo vroom vroom cap. I'm really proud of this stuff and it would mean a lot to me if you guys checked out the website in the link below. It supports the channel and it makes your wardrobe just a little bit cooler at the same time. Check it out at mysteriesgarage.com. That's mysteriesgarage.com. Patreons get 10% off. Now, back to the video. So, I had to come up with a list of categories to rank all the tracks on. After a bit of thinking, I came up with these. Track length, average speed, number of corners, windiness, which is basically how many corners per kilometer it has. I wanna know how bendy it is. Elevation change and elevation, those are two different things. Pit lane time loss, longest straight, top speed, full throttle percentage, and distance from the grid to turn one. I also wanted to throw in a few non-geographical stats to make sure that we got the most average track with the most average Grand Prix weekend. So we're also gonna be looking at attendance, average ticket price, and average winning grid position. Once we've got all of those, we can see which track on average has a rank of 12.5, because that's halfway between one and 24, not 12. Therefore, we can declare it the most average track in Formula One 2024. Let's get into it. Let's start with a simple one, track length. The longest track on the calendar is of course Spa, at just over seven kilometers and therefore rank one. The shortest track, Monaco, 3.337 kilometers, therefore rank 24. Interestingly, two tracks are exactly the same length to the nearest meter. Bahrain and Miami, so those are joint rank 11 right in the middle of the pack. Average speed next, which is calculated as the average dry fastest lap from the last few seasons divided by track length. Unsurprisingly, Monza is rank 1 here with a 241 kph 
average speed around the track. Rank 24, again, Monaco, with only 153 kph. 153, that's basically walking pace, come on. Number of corners, again, is a pretty simple one. This is self-determined based on each track's official track map. Personally, I think calling turn one at Imola a corner is pretty generous, but that's what the track map says, we're using official numbers. Saudi Arabia has an absolutely ludicrous 27 corners, all the way down to Austria with only 10 corners, rank 24. Austria, have you considered counting your corners the same way that Imola and Jeddah do? You might find you have a few more than you previously thought. Windiness is a new stat I've invented for this video. Basically, I wanted to see how straight or not a track is, and so I thought the best way to do that would be to look at the number of corners per kilometer. By this metric, Saudi Arabia is actually one of the least straight places you can go. Not sure the Saudi government's going to be too pleased about that news. Monza is the least windy of all the tracks, which is not surprising as it's basically just a NASCAR oval. We then have elevation and elevation change. I've put both of these in as they affect cars in different ways. High elevation change can up the difficulty of a track by having cresting corners or long sweeping downhill corners where the front end of your car gets light. High elevation above sea level reduces air density, which has an effect on engine performance as well as aerodynamic performance. For elevation change, I'm going to say more is better because really no one likes a flat car park track. Again, surprising no one, Spa has the highest elevation change at over 100 meters between the lowest and highest points. Jeddah, on the other hand, has the least. I couldn't actually find an official elevation map for the Jeddah Corniche circuit, so instead I opened Google Earth and used the elevation tool. It told me that the lowest point is 2 meters above sea level and the highest point is a whopping 4 meters above sea level. Thrilling. That brings us nicely into altitude, also known as elevation above sea level. This one is not as simple as you think because the term sea level is not as simple as you think. I found an official F1 article talking about the elevation of each track, and it claimed that the lowest point in Monaco is 47 meters above sea level. Are you sure about that? Then I realized they're using global mean sea level and the earth isn't a perfect sphere, so the water here isn't at zero. It's a whole thing. Anyway, I just went on Google Earth again, put a pin on the finish line and went with the elevation that it said. It's well known that Mexico City is high in the sky, with the start finish line sitting at roughly 2,231 meters above sea level. That's quite high. The lowest track on the calendar? Baku, 24 meters below sea level. At this point in the experiment, we have quite a few tracks around the magic 12.5 mark with one track exactly on it, Monza. Uh, not sure about you, but I wouldn't exactly call Monza average. I think we need to do some more categories. Pit lane time loss varies because every track has a slightly different pit lane length. In general, I would say that a lower time here is better for racing as it enables more strategy options, but every other category is going big number rank one, and this is gonna be no different. According to Formula One itself, the Singapore Grand Prix has an absolutely disgusting 30 second pit lane time loss. That's enough time for Nikita Matspin to DNF a Bahrain Grand Prix. On the other end of the spectrum, a pit in Canada only loses you about 18 seconds, which makes sense because you do skip out three entire corners when you pit here. Our next category is longest straight, which sounds simple when you first hear it, but we need to ask the deeply philosophical question, what is a straight? That's easy. It's just the straight parts of a track, right? Oh, my sweet summer child, my naive little baby, tell me. Where are your straights now? I came to the conclusion that we will go with the longest flat out section of each track, which raises another question because some corners are flat out sometimes? Basically, if it's reasonably possible to take it flat in a modern Formula 1 car, even if it's only in quality trim, I've included it. This means that several tracks don't use their longest straight section for this. Jeddah actually uses this bit. Spa goes all the way from the source to Le Com if you got the stones for it, and it's a similar story in Suzuka around 130R. Now, before you go leave me comments down below saying that you can't take these corners flat in the Formula 1 games, have you considered that might just be a skill issue? I again measured this in the most accurate way known to mankind. Bosh. It turns out that even though several tracks have absolutely monstrous full flat sections, none of them come even close to Baku with its 2.1 kilometer straight. In theory, there are four corners between turn 16 and turn one around Baku, but a modern Formula One car can 
easily do all of these flat, leading to a straight which is 63% of the entire length of the Monaco circuit, which coincidentally has the shortest straight at only 670 meters. You might think that having the longest straight also equates to having the highest top speed and sort of, but also no. Monza is top here again, shock, and Mexico is second place due to the complete lack of any air resistance. Monaco is ranked 24 again by being the only circuit where cars don't go over 300 kph. Full throttle percentage might surprise a few of you. Baku, with its enormous straight, is only driven at full throttle for 49% of the lap, putting it in 23rd place. The only track with less time on the gas is Mexico, 24th place with only 45% full throttle, which is one of the main reasons it's so impossible to overtake anyone around here. Top of the list, again, surprising no one, it's Monza. 84% full throttle. I'm pretty sure there's actual oval tracks with less. A large distance from the grid to turn one gives a track maximum opportunity for buffoonery, shenanigans, and all around silly antics off the line. Therefore, big number better. Mexico is our champion here, giving drivers almost a kilometer off the line to fight into turn one. The other end of the spectrum sees Las Vegas, where the pole position is basically in the braking zone for turn one. Okay, okay, we can put Google Earth away now. Time to bring out some social stats to make sure the most average track also has the most average fan experience. Attendance was actually a pretty weird one to rank. Most tracks publish official weekend attendance every year, but some refuse for whatever reason. And then on some tracks, the ticketed attendance is actually very different to the total number of live spectators. Think of Monaco, where every single person with a balcony in the track seems to invite 10 friends around to watch. I took the most recent official figure for attendance, or if there hasn't been one in the last few years, a reputable estimate for each track, and we get this. The British Grand Prix is the most attended, and if you've ever been, this is not surprising. The total event is massive. I was a little surprised though to find the least attended race is Baku, and pretty consistently every year. I thought it might be caused by high ticket prices in Baku, but actually, it's very middle of the pack when it comes to average ticket price. Las Vegas is by far and away the winner here. To clarify, the fans aren't winners, no, no. The people selling the seats, they're the winners. And our cheapest race to attend on average is actually China, with an average three-day grandstand ticket costing only £157. That's honestly really good. I might have to buy myself some flights to Shanghai next year. Wait, how much are flights? Honestly, thought they were going to be way more than that. This is seeming like a really good idea right now. Keep an eye out for me in the grandstands at Shanghai next year, I suppose. And so our final category is average winning grid position. This is a fun one. We often hear how certain tracks are always won from the front row and how Monaco is decided on a Saturday. But how true is that? I took all the races for all of the tracks in the 10 years from 2014 to 2023, which for some tracks is 12 races and for others, Las Vegas is one, and looked up the grid position of the winner every race. We have two races that have only been won from pole, the Dutch Grand Prix and Qatar. We also have two races that have never been won from pole, the one and only Las Vegas Grand Prix won by Max Verstappen from P2 on the grid, and then Miami, which has been won from third and ninth and then also fifth in 2024, but that's not included, so don't look at that. Several tracks actually have an average winning grip position of P3 or higher. This is obviously skewed up by a few high outliers, such as Verstappen's charge through the field in Hungary 2022, or maybe Verstappen's charge through the field in Belgium 2022, or perhaps Verstappen's charge through the field in Belgium. But these outliers aside, there's an interesting fact hidden in here that I think most people don't know. Monaco, the track where it's impossible to overtake for the win, has an average winning grid position of 1.77, putting it in 17th place. That means there are seven whole tracks that are more predictable than Monaco. In the nine Monaco races in this period, less than half were won from pole. Admittedly, none were won from any lower than P3 on the grid, but it's still on par with the rest of the calendar. And so, once and for all, I would like to put to bed the idea that Monaco is boring because the winner is always predictable. It is still boring, don't get me wrong, but for other reasons. And so, with all of our categories completed, we can find the average rank for each track and plot them all on this massive graph. According to this, Las Vegas, Italy and Belgium, Monaco, Canada and the Netherlands are the least average circuits on the calendar, and that checks out. But who's in the middle? One track did in fact finish with exactly a 12.5 average rank, and that track is... Baku City? 
But wait, wait, Baku City ranked one in several categories and it ranked 24th in several others. Has it made it to 12.5 by flip-flopping between the two extremes? Yes. I don't want this video to turn into a statistics lesson, but we do need to look at something called variance, i.e. how far each result is from the average result. A high variance would mean that the track comes first and 24th every time, and a low variance means it's coming 12th and 13th. How high is Baku's variance? Literally almost the highest of all the calendar. Hmm, okay. If Baku got the perfect score, but it got there in an unreliable way, doesn't it make more sense to choose a track with a similar score but a much lower variance? I mean, this one looks pretty good. It's got an average rank of 13.1 and almost the lowest variance of the entire calendar. Let's take a look at what track this is. No, 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 it's Spain, the circuit to Barcelona, Catalonia. I made this entire video to prove the Sky F1 pundits wrong and instead I've become the very thing I sought to destroy. No. They can't possibly be right. A team of media professionals and ex-drivers who travel with the sport every weekend. How could they possibly have come up with the right answer? <clears throat> well, okay, so it turns out Barcelona is in fact the most mid of all the mid tracks. A real meh of an event. I'm not going to give a conclusion whether it's a good or bad thing that the most average track on the calendar is leaving us after the end of next year. In a way, it is nice to have a big variety of tracks, but on the other hand, if we wanted the sport to alternate between high-speed power tracks and windy street tracks with no grip, well, you could just watch IndyCar. I'm not going to defend Catalonia. I don't really think the changes to the track last year have improved it at all. I did make an entire video telling them how to do it, and then they ignored me, so really, that's on them. One conclusion we can make, though, is the cars which were quick around Catalonia last weekend are probably the strongest overall packages in F1 2024. Max Verstappen won the race, obviously, but Lando Norris did seem to have the best long run pace when in free air. Can't forget as well that Mercedes have jumped back up to third and fourth. Are they now quicker than Ferrari overall? Not looking good for Hamilton if that's the case. <laughs> it looks like we could be in for a pretty spicy second half of the season with Max Verstappen and Lando Norris out front. Please, dear God, title battle, please. And then if Ferrari and Mercedes also keep improving and they start challenging for wins too, we could be in for a banger. It's copium, but it's all I've got. If you like this video, give it a like down below and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Until that time though, I've been Mr. V and I'll see you guys later.